Hello everyone, this is John Mark Johnson Jr. again, and I had a video that I wanted to review with you guys. And this is a video that was put out by uh, Doug Wilson, and you know, there's lots of good things that Doug has managed to do, especially uh, with regard to Eastern Orthodoxy and those kinds of things, and I appreciate his efforts on that one. That being said, when it comes to the issue of uh, textual uh, basis, I'm a little bit disappointed in him. And this uh, particular video that he put out is just, um, it has a great many errors in it. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go through the, the video and talk about those errors. Now this video that he put out was basically divided into two parts. We're going to listen to the entire first part and then we'll talk about it. And then we'll do uh, the same with the second part. Okay, so give him a full hearing on this one. The total video isn't very long. It's only just a touch over uh, five minutes, so it's about uh, two, two and a half minutes on one side, two, two and, a half, uh, two and a half minutes on the other. Let's go ahead and get into it here. Why do you prefer the Byzantine text over the Alexandrian? Um, there are many reasons, but uh, the basic one is it is the most widespread text uh, available from the ancient world. Uh, it, the way I illustrate it, and, and the argument on the other side, is the, um, what the NIV calls the two most ancient reliable manuscripts go about a hundred years earlier. So they are the most ancient full texts that we have. But all of them are 300 years or so after the autographs, uh, the, the original writings of the New Testament. And that's a lot of time. So if you picture the autographs as the headwaters of a great river, um, and you've got this huge river that's five miles, uh, five miles wide, uh, and you're walking up the left bank, and and you're stopped, you're prevented from walking any further. You know the headwaters are still miles away, and the river is still, you know, miles wide. That tells you that that manuscript tra tradition was widespread a hundred years, two hundred years prior because rivers don't get that wide in 10 feet. Um, the Alexandrian text type is just a sliver of the available manuscripts. It goes 100 years earlier. On the right bank you can go farther upstream. You can go farther upstream. On the left bank you can't, but it's a big fat wide river at that point. So I, I believe that the internal consistency in the Textus Receptus is better than the uh, internal consistency of the Alexandrian text type. Um, I believe that it was the um, the text family that the church preserved throughout its history. Uh, and the Westminster Confession, to which I subscribe, says that God um, providentially preserved his text throughout history, which is not the same thing as causing it to disappear for um, 1500 years and then have it rediscovered in the 19th century uh, when people are doing text criticism. So uh, that's a short uh, short form of why I prefer the one manuscript family to the other. Could you, I, I should have added more. Okay, and that's where the, the second part of the video basically starts. Okay, so um, lots of errors in a very brief period of time that was only you know, less than two and a half minutes of airtime there, and he already managed to basically uh, misrepresent uh, the issue that's going on with the text of the New Testament um, almost about as thoroughly as you can, you know, um, right from the foundation up. For example, he started out by saying that there's basically just two main lines of text. There's the Alexandrian, there's uh, the Byzantine, and these are the two main streams, and that's it. That's actually not true. Um, and hopefully, uh, Doug, uh, I think Doug Wilson would be aware of this, but it didn't make it into the video, that there are more text forms than that. There is the Byzantine, there's the Alexandrian, there's also the Western uh, text. Uh, some scholars would argue for another form on top of that called the Caesarean. And there's actually some uh, textual scholars such as the Alans who would uh, uh, produce classifications of up to five different text types and things like that. But there's certainly more than two. There's certainly more than two streams of manu uh, manuscripts. So right off the bat, he's creating a false dichotomy. The fact is, there's actually quite a few different lines of manuscripts that are out there that have 
uh, certain similar features in common. And um, it's not just as simple as this or that. It's this one or that one or that one, so on and so forth. And most modern textual scholars use an eclectic methodology, which means that they examine evidence from all of them. And there are parts uh, uh, from time to time where they will side, um, say, against the Alexandrian text from time to time, or against uh, the Western, or against the Byzantine, uh, depending on uh, how the evidence as a whole happens to uh, to uh, meet out on that one. Uh, in fact, actually, the vast majority of time, the, uh, the Byzantine, Alexandrian, Western texts agree. It's only in the points where they differ, uh, you know, that there's any great interest. But most of the time, uh, they're actually going to be in agreement. Um, and that would usually be about 95% of the time they're going to say pretty much exactly the same thing. Um, there might be a few um, differences here and there, but as far as when you come to the point of producing a printed text from which you can make Bible translations, like I said, usually it's about 95% agreement. There's not a, a substantial difference most of the time. Okay, so there's the, the first error is making it it's Alexandrian or the Byzantine, that, that false dichotomy that he sets up. And then he uses this analogy of, uh, of a river. You know, a river has headwaters and it flows out and flows out and flows out. It gets wider and wider and wider. You get more and more manuscripts is basically the idea. And that part of it isn't a bad analogy. That's, that's okay. And then he says that the situation that we have is that, again, using that false dichotomy, on the Byzantine manuscripts, you can only get back this far. Alexandrian is just a little bit further. But most of the river matches the, the Byzantine, even though the Alexandrian goes back further. So that's his argument. Most of the river at this point is Byzantine, even though the, the Alexandrian goes back a little bit further, but it's not by much. He's definitely <laughs> misrepresenting the, the situation on that one. He, he even said both of these text forms come 300 years after the time of the autographs. That's just simply untrue both that most of the early uh, manuscripts would match the, the Byzantine, that most of them that you'd have here would match the, eh, the Byzantine. That's not true. And then also that they're 300 years afterwards. Let me go ahead and show you a, a pictorial representation of what I'm talking about here. All right, so this here is a diagram that shows the relative proportions of non-Byzantine manuscripts to Byzantine manuscripts as time progresses. And this is a pretty exhaustive uh, chart here. This goes all the way up through the 10th century, so the 900s AD. And it starts back at the second hundred. You might ask why it doesn't start with the first century and, and instead starts with the second century. And the reason for that is we don't have any first century manuscripts. As Doug Wilson said, we, we, are, we are separated from uh, the original autographs. We don't have any first century documents. And... And so there is going to be an issue uh, that way around that all textual credits are going to have to have to work with. So we have second manuscripts going forward. Now, the numbers here that are given are a little bit more reserved, especially from the, the point of view of someone who's an Alexandrian text advocate or in a critical, uh, more actually all um, texts are critical in a sense that you have to think about them in some way, shape or form. Um, but at least an eclectic methodology, this would be a little bit more reserved against them um, because there are some people who would be in a, a minority position like uh, Philip Comfort, and I would happen to agree with Philip Comfort on this one, that the number of second century manuscripts should actually probably higher, should be actually probably closer to 12 manuscripts instead of four. Um, but I'm not going to argue, you know, should this uh, manuscript be listed as a second, third century manuscript or should it be second century proper? That's not really material to this debate. But here's the, the points. In the second century, you get a lot of fragmentary manuscripts are kind of small, but they do not, but they're not distinctly Byzantine at that point. And now they're really small, and so it's hard to, to be really specific about the text type, but there's nothing that's specific in them that calls them out as Byzantine. Third century, the manuscripts tend to get quite a bit longer, and you can get a really good sense of what text type it is. And none of the third century manuscripts that I'm aware of, at least ones that would be of any length and usually quite significant, there's you know one or two here that you could argue about. Uh, but by and large, none of them would be considered uh, Byzantine. And there's you know at least 49 that we would have from the third century. In the 4th century, we get about 48 manuscripts altogether, but of that 48, 47 of them are definitely not Byzantine. 
There's one that you could kind of count in the 4th century for the Byzantine. That would be uh, probably Codex Alexandrinus, which is actually technically 5th century is how most people would list it, but we're going to be generous here and we're going to list it as a 4th century manuscript. Um, but still, vast majority of them are not Byzantine. 5th century, same things happen. Most of them are not Byzantine. It's 53 to 6. 6th century, 88 to 13. 7th century, 63 to 6. 8th century, 84 to 16. 9th century, 177 to 64. 10th century, 314 to 121. That is, through basically the first Christian millennium, the Byzantine uh, manuscripts represent a minority. That is, you never see them getting above about 30% of all of the manuscripts that we have for each century of the first, first Christian millennium. It is a distinct minority. And what we see with this, if we want to take this as being the river, what we see is there's basically a change in the current starting 4th, 5th century uh, that winds up eventually taking over. If you were to extend this and put the 11th century, 12th century, and, the, and so on on top of it, eventually this would start taking over. And that's what we see here. There's one type of manuscript that starts out, but then it blends into something else as time uh, goes on. That's what's actually happening when you look at the manuscripts. And Doug Wilson completely misrepresents this. You know, he talks about the two primary witnesses, you know, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. Well, that's true. Those are two manuscripts that are definitely not Byzantine. And they're good manuscripts that come from a orderly point, 4th century. But there's also manuscripts before them that are not Byzantine, and there's also a lot of manuscripts after them that are not Byzantine. They happen to be um, more or less kind of the icons of uh, the type, but they're certainly not the only ones, not by any stretch of the imagination. And like I said, in the first millennium, the Byzantine text type is certainly not a majority. If you listen to what Doug Wilson says, you know, it's like all of, you know, all of the the, and the vast majority of the swath is Byzantine, except, and, you know, you have this little portion, you know, representing the Alexandrian that comes down, and it's, it's just not like that. First of all, it's not Byzantine versus Alexandrian. It's Byzantine versus Western versus Alexandrian, possibly Caesarean, possibly uh, one, at least one other category, maybe more, depending on if you talk to the Alans and uh, those kind of folks. Um, but it's much more complicated than that. And what we see is the Byzantine text growing in popularity as time goes on, but it doesn't start that way. And for the first Christian millennium, it's not the most popular text form. Okay, it is not the one with the widest amount of support early on. That's something that happens later, not earlier. Okay, so this is a very misleading thing that he says. Now, once we start getting into the 9th century, 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, up through the 16th century, you see a lot more Byzantine types of manuscripts. That's true. But it would definitely be an error to say that at the, the point where we start seeing a juncture between the two, that at the point where we see that juncture, it's mostly Byzantine to non-Byzantine. That's, that's just not true. At the point where we start seeing the juncture between the uh, two, it's mostly non-Byzantine. And eventually the Byzantine becomes more popular, but that's after the first Christian millennium. That's a significant while down the road. Okay, so on that level, Doug Wilson's argument fails, and it fails horribly. Okay, but of course that wasn't the only thing that he said. He also talked about the internal consistency of the text form. I'm not really sure what he means by internal consistency, because he just got done talking about the, the multitude of manuscripts that are out there and um no and uh, the the two aren't really related to each other they're different questions and he meshed them together as if they were the same thing you know there's all of these manuscripts that are byzantine and he makes it seem like all the byzantine manuscripts show up really early on with just a few alexandrian manuscripts showing up before that that's not the case it's mostly non-byzantine for the first Christian millennium, and the um, the Byzantine stream is it starts taking over, uh, kind of starting in the fourth fifth century with Codex Alexandrinus and maybe a, a papyrus manuscript or two, but for the vast majority of the manuscripts for the the first Christian millennium, they're not Byzantine at all, and then he talks about the issue of the internal consistency. And 
uh, I'll grant you that the uh, the Byzantine manuscripts are typically more consistent within themselves than a lot of the non-Byzantine manuscripts, because the non-Byzantine manuscripts would include the Alexandrian, it would include uh, the Western text types, possibly Caesarean, and a few other things. The early text was very varied. And so if you're talking about you know, how much consistency there is. Well, yeah, the ones later on where people started to standardize the text, a lot like they did with the Quran, where they started creating a standardized text after the, the fact, where they told everyone, this is the, the version of the text that you're going to start using, and it has to have these elements in it, so on and so forth, and it became standardized. Well, of course, it's going to be a lot more internally consistent. But the problem is that the textual variants that crept into the manuscript tradition didn't creep in up there. They were standardized up there, but they crept in where you had the most variety, where you had the Alexandrian, where you had the uh, Western text type, proto forms of the, uh, the Byzantine and possibly Caesarean and all those kinds of things. Most of the stuff that's going on that's pertinent to the New Testament, and which versions are accurate and which ones aren't, all happened in that early period. So if you limit yourself to what comes later, after the text has been standardized, you've run into the same problem that the Muslims have with the Quran. Their version of the Quran that they have, there's actually a few modern versions of the Quran that they have, but their version of the Quran that they have that's the most popular one is a text that came into existence much, much, much later, and it's very standardized now, and it's you know very popular, most people know it, and it's actually to the point where a good number of Muslim communities, you can say it's on you know this particular... Uh, surah and verse, this particular passage, is, you know, on the right-hand uh, side of the page, about uh, uh, middle of the page down. You can you can say that because it's just literally just one edition that they have uh, that's completely standardized across. But the problem is that just because they have this great standardization now doesn't mean that that's what was originally given. In fact, if you look at older chronic manuscripts, there are variants. And there's a lot of good evidence to say that what they have now is not what was originally given, at least not perfectly. Uh, and this is the same thing that occurs with basically all uh, historical manuscripts, because there's always that tendency to try to standardize things. And this is what Protestantism historically was fighting against. This is what had happened with Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy. They developed these standardized uh, textual platforms and they basically used them as they saw fit, so basically as a, as a set of proof texts to prove whatever they wanted to. And, of course, then you get the Protestants coming along, the Reformers at the time. They, they didn't become full-grown Protestants until later. Originally, they were trying to reform the Church, especially the Roman Catholic Church, uh, and to a lesser extent, Eastern Orthodoxy. But they were trying to reform Christianity at that point, and once they... It became very clear that <laughs> Roman Catholics didn't want to be reformed, neither did the Eastern Orthodox. Then they started the protest. Then they started going to their own churches and those kinds of uh, things just because it was Reformation wasn't possible in that sense. If they were going to do Reformation, it was going to be outside of the church establishment. And this is something that Doug Wilson does talk about in other videos. You know, he, he wants there to... He's okay with a certain amount of textual criticism going on, but he wants it to be within the church establishment. And that's just not Protestantism. Church uh, Protestantism challenges the standard view of things to ask what was originally given. That's what we were originally doing when we started coming up with our early translations and whatnot, when instead of where the traditional text at the time and the vast majority of manuscripts still read, Manuscripts, handwritten manuscripts, still read that Jesus' first uh, message given in uh, Matthew 4, 17 was do penance for the kingdom of heaven is at hand instead of repent. And of course, that would be the, the Latin version, of course, but that is the majority version, and it was the majority used by the predominant church. And of, of course, then you also have problems with Eastern Orthodoxy on their side and the way that they would interpret things. And of course, Doug Wilson would be aware of a lot of the issues with Eastern Orthodoxy. But it's just not a consistent position for a Protestant to let go of that standard and say we're going to go with the majority used by a particular church group, given that Protestantism developed by countering the church group and asking what was original instead of what had come to be accepted. It's entirely inconsistent what he's arguing for here, and it doesn't match the facts. He misrepresented the facts. Okay, The fact of the matter is that for the first Christian millennium, the Byzantine text is not the predominant text. That comes later, and it develops, and you could see that down at the at the bottom, you know, in the fourth century, that was that little bit, and then it started to uh, increase in number after that. 
and then eventually it explodes into popularity after a certain point. But for the first Christian millennium, the Byzantine text was not the majority text. Not at all. It wasn't the ecclesiastical text or any other qualification that you want to put on it. It just wasn't the case. Now, there's also another part in here that he said that I wanted to make sure that I caught. Let me see if I can get it. Family that the church preserved throughout its history. Uh, and the Westminster Confession, to which I subscribe, says that God um, providentially preserved his text throughout history, which is not the same thing as causing it to disappear for um, 1,500 years and then have it rediscovered in the 19th century uh, when people are doing text criticism. So, Okay, and that's the part that I wanted to come back to, is that whole argument that, well, the Westminster Confession of Faith says that it was providentially preserved. And one thing that we have to remember is that the Westminster Confession of Faith is a confession. It's not scripture itself. It's not this, uh, the sole infallible standard there. Confessions, creeds, all of those things are always under scripture. And because of that, determining scripture comes first to all of those things. Okay, so you're taking an authority that is not a primary and making it basically into a primary in this case in order to establish your textual basis for the Bible. So that's kind of a backwards thinking already. But the main argument that I have with this one really is that it's an unscriptural uh, uh, reference. Go back to 2 Kings 22. I mean, seriously, look it up. 2 Kings 22, you have the reign of Josiah. And what happens during the reign of Josiah? The book of the law, scripture at their time, what they had as scripture at their time, is found. If it was found, what does that mean that it was before? Lost. So is the statement that Doug Wilson is making based on the Westminster Confession of Faith actually biblically accurate? That is, has God historically, from what we know from the Bible, always preserved his text in a way that the people always have it in their possession at every time? Obviously not with Second Kings uh, 22. It says that the book of the law was found, implying that it had been lost, which means that there was a period of time where the people were ac acting not only without an accurate version of the Bible, but without a version of the Bible, period. How do you get around that fact. And this is where people like myself, who are biblical historical Christians, where we're asking, what did the Bible originally say? Versus people like Doug Wilson, who's saying, what did the Bible eventually come to say? Differ. We um, both believe in the preservation of scripture, but we mean very different things by that. In his uh, mind, there's no preservation of scripture unless every generation has basically the same form of the text available to them. That's what he means by preservation. It's a continuing preservation. My th view, though, and the view of people like me, is what we like to call the biblical view of the preservation of the text. That, the ver ac that an accurate version of the text will still exist that people can use to go back to, but that doesn't mean that it's going to always be available. There will be times when it will be lost uh, to the population as a whole. That's what Second uh, Kings 22 very clearly demonstrates. The book of the law had been lost prior to King Josiah's time. During his reign, it was discovered in the temple of all places. I'm not sure how you lose the book of the law in the temple. You would think that somebody would have known where it was, but they managed to lose the book of the law in the temple. That in and of itself is an interesting sermon. But they had lost the book of the law. They didn't have it available to them. So does that mean that God didn't preserve his word because they didn't have it available to them in the most accurate, perfect form possible? No. He was preserving his word, but it was hidden to them for a time. And later on, at the time of his choosing, it was revealed to them. And that's the same thing that we have going on now. Just because someone has a version of the text, it doesn't mean that it's accurate. Now, if it's accurate, then it's accurate. But just assuming that because that's what you've come to accept that it's accurate is very faulty logic. That's not the question. The pertinent, uh, the important question isn't what has come to be accepted. The question is what was originally given. And that is the fundamental distinction 
between people like myself and people like Doug Wilson. Let's go ahead and listen to the rest of his video here. Uh, that's a short, uh, short form of why I prefer the one manuscript family to the other. Could you, I, sh I should have added more to this question, but could you give an intro to this question in terms of just relating these to, you know, the Byzantine text is, is the basis for this series oh. and the, oh, uh, yeah. a lot of people may not have that all in their mind, you know, and so if we'll do this as like section two on New King James. So you'd like me to do section one, an intro to the... Yeah, if you, if you could provide the... I'm still rolling, you can still do the introduction now. And I'll just... Okay. Yeah, if you could all just right. provide the context for this question as it relates to the New King James. Sure. Or... <coughs> Uh, a lot of a lot of Christians have a uh, have questions about text families and translations and so forth and and there are two main issues one is translation philosophy and the other is manuscript the manuscripts from which the translation occurs the basic debate be in translation philosophy is formal equivalence reproducing the original as, as closely as you can and dynamic equivalence. Uh, which would be getting the gist and speaking in idioms, modern idioms, getting the, the broad sense of it. So the NIV is a dynamic equivalence. The message would be an uber dynamic equivalence. Uh, the King James would be a formal equivalence. The New American Standard would be a formal equivalence. So that's one set of variables. Then you've got uh, what, tr what manuscripts were these, were these Bibles translated from? Uh, there are two basic... Um, text families, Byzantine and Alexandrian, and they and th there are different names that are given. And again, we've given it, and it said it's not that simple. Okay, it's not just Byzantine and Alexandrian. There's the Western text type in there, possibly Caesarean, possibly even one more than that of Kiel, with the, uh, the Alans classification system, and theirs isn't even that simple. It's actually a complete re resystemization there. Um, as far as ones that feature, feature prominently in debates between someone like myself and someone like Doug Wilson, yeah, the Byzantine and the Alexandrian are the ones that show up the most, and that might be what he's referring to. These are the two most hotly contested that tend to butt up against each other. Uh, but just keep in mind, it's not that simple. The, uh, the, the uh, Codex Sinaiticus and Vaticanus are the, are the minority texts and they lie underneath virtually all modern translations, all the contemporary translations. Uh, NIV, RSV, New American Standard, uh, ESV, in some way they lie underneath um, those translations. Then the Byzantine text type, or uh, the, the Reformational printing era name for it was the Textus Receptus, that underlies the King James Bible and to a smaller extent the New King James. Um, and so you've got two different things going on, translation philosophy and manuscripts from which it's, uh, the, tr the translation is done. The New American Standard is formal equivalence, the method I prefer, um, but I don't like the manuscripts that they're, they're translating from. Um, and someone could conceive, nobody's done it yet, but someone could conceivably do a really hip ver uh, translation dynamic equivalence from the Textus Receptus. Uh, but that's not been done yet. Okay, the second portion of the video I don't mind as much as the first part. The first part, there was just all kinds of errors. Oh, they're all removed by 300 years at least. No, oh, you can find manuscripts that come within 100 years of some of the originals of the New Testament. Yeah, that's <laughs> okay, so that's wrong. Oh, the majority of the stream, once we start seeing the Byzantine come in, is this broad swath that's mostly Byzantine. That's not the case. It was very small, and then it grew as time went on. Um, but yeah, just complete misrepresentations on that way. It's just this or that. No, it's there's actually quite a bit more that's involved there. So the first part was definitely worse in those regards. The latter part wasn't so bad. Um, it did uh, say that the New King James is based on uh, the Texas Receptus to a lesser extent than the King James, which is not exactly true because the two actually have basically the exact same underlying text. The New King James uh, text that underlies it is the same that Scrivener put together based on the King James text, what the uh, King James translators had decided to put together for their text. 
is basically the same one that was used for the New King James. So those two texts, the King James and the New King James, have virtually identical underlying Greek texts. So um, I'm not sure why <laughs> Doug Wilson would argue about that so much. Maybe he's drawing in a, a comparison with the, the Byzantine text as a whole, which would be different from the Textus Receptus. Um, but for the most part, what he says in the second part of the video, I'm not really too upset about. You know, he talks about the difference between formal and dynamic uh, equivalence a translations and gives a few examples of them, not bad examples. And then, you know, and also says that there's an issue with the text. And that's, you know, is basically the issues that are going on with all translations is how it's translated and what you're translating it from. You know, that, that part's not really so uh, much of a problem. But um, what he said in the first part regarding why we should go with the Byzantine manuscripts versus something that might be non-Byzantine um, just isn't, <laughs> it just doesn't accurately represent what's going on. Uh, but at the same time, this is very common for a lot of people who are against uh, the modern texts. Um, they don't like it. It's not what they're used to. And even to a certain extent, Doug Wilson just admitted that. He says it's not based on the, you know, the manuscripts that I like. I do like that it's formal. He's talking about the NASB, uh, the New American Standard Bible. He says, you know, I like that it's formal, but it's not based on the manuscripts that I like. And because of that, I, you know, I wouldn't be as prone to using it as what he's implying there. And, um, and this is the issue that a lot of people have with it. You know, there might not be KJV only us, but they still like a lot of the traditional KJV passages. And so they kind of go through these conniptions uh, and all these different things to try to defend those uh, texts. And in so doing, they usually wind up misrepresenting the history. The fact that Protestantism has been against establishment uh, systems that were not asked uh, that Protestants, you know, from the beginning were not asking what has come to be accepted. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been Protestants. There would not have been any protest if we had done it that way. Instead, they wanted to know what was original, and they worked outside of the normal church structures in order to figure that out, uh, because the normal church structures always come with a certain amount of tradition, and tradition can be very useful in preserving things, but it can also wind up preserving things that are original as well. And because of that, you always have to be a little bit careful there. All right, so that's my rant on this one. I have other things that I need to do this evening, so I won't spend too much time more on time on this. But I did want to correct those very gross errors in this video. Anyways, thank you for your time and attention. And as always, for those of you who are in Christ, go with God and be blessed. For those of you who are not, I pray that you would come to an understanding of the true Christ of history the only genuine savior of mankind. Amen.